All right, it looks like we have the bulk of the attendees already in, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Lucas Lachance. I'm the partner of Practice Growth here at Lane Gorman Trubert and, Trubert, and I am very happy to welcome you here to today's webinar. All of our webinars, the entire eight-part series, are now open for registration, and you can check out the full list on our events page, which will be added to the chat in just a few minutes. Coming up, we have two more exciting webinars you don't want to miss. On June 28th, join us to learn about chat GPT for your business from our own marketing manager, Josh Woods. And on July 12th, learn about the world of artificial intelligence relating to data analytics from Dr. Helen Liu at TMAC and Lamar University. I see a lot of first time people joining us today, which is great. Let me tell you a little bit about the firm before we get started. Um, Lane Gorman Tribute is a mid-sized accounting firm for businesses of all sizes. In 2023, LGT is providing endless opportunities to gain CPE credit. These events are created to help your business grow and thrive. We cover a broad range of topics that are impactful to businesses in the construction, manufacturing and distribution, dealer services, real estate, and not-for-profit industries this year. But we always want to make sure that we're providing you with information that's relevant to the work that you do. So please take a few minutes and fill out the evaluation at the end of the event, and be sure to leave comments and suggestions for future events. The webinar will be, is being recorded and will be available within two business days following the end of the event, and it will be sent to you in a link via your email. It will also be available on LGT's YouTube channel, and you can find the link for that on our website. If you, if you have any questions about this or any service that you'd like from LGT, uh, please reach out to set up a free consultation to determine how we can help your organization. Please email us at askus at lgt-cpa.com. This is a continuing professional education event, and you will receive one hour of CPE credit upon completion of the class evaluation. Now, you know this isn't our first rodeo, so you have to do the evaluation first before you get your CPE certificate. Following the webinar, you'll receive an email from Prolera, which is our CPE provider. Fill out the survey to receive the CPE certificate. Please take a second again to um, provide information on the survey about what you'd like to see for future events. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, don't hesitate to add them to the Q&A. Um, we have a lot of information to cover today, so we will be answering those toward the end of the presentation. And that brings us to the star of the show, and I'm very excited to introduce Anthony Francis. Anthony Francis is an internationally recognized expert in supply chain and logistics. He has a deep understanding of the end-to-end -end supply chain, fulfillment operations, e-commerce, both B2B and B2C, returns processing and product repair. Currently, he's a consultant in supply chain and technology and SME to Endava, PLC, and other clients, advising on digital transformation and supply chain issues. Previously, he was a VP of logistics and e-commerce for FedEx EMEA and president of ATC Logistics and Electronics, which is now FedEx in Fort Worth. He's a board member of HOBI International and the Dallas Opera, and he is also a member of the World Affairs Council. Anthony, we're so happy that you joined us today. Thank you for taking time with us. Well, Lucas, thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Great. Well, um, let's go ahead and dive in. We've got a lot of ground to cover. Um, do you think that, let's start with a, a topic that's on everyone's mind um, really right now, and that is inflation. Um, do you think that inflation is going to be a primary disruptor to supply chain, to supply chain woes of 21 and 22? Yeah, it, it's clearly, it rocked the, the whole COVID thing, rocked the boat for everyone. And uh, <laughs> I think we're lucky to have survived three of the craziest years in supply chain disruption. Um, and I, you know, look at several areas of that, and we'll get into some of them more around interest rates later on. But the first effect was really in labor. And um, you see the what we call the Amazon effect. A uh, number of companies that I advise here down in the DFW area uh, were paying, say, $12.50, $13 an hour uh, for late for hourly work workers on, on lines. And suddenly um, we were seeing competition offering $15, $16 an hour. And uh, as COVID hit and people were losing in, in, uh, employees to medical leave. And so uh, that had a knock-on effect right across the, the the whole business environment down here. And you were seeing people ha just having to follow on. And so suddenly you had a jump of 10, 15% in labor rates. 
that has an immediate knock-on effect in, uh, in, on the infl in inflation. And people were finding their, just at home, their shopping carts going, you know, you'd hear everyone say, well, I used to spend $100 a week, now I'm spending 120 or 200 or whatever that number was. Um, the same effect was happening in behind the business environment uh, in the supply chain. So it's not only labor, but it's also um, um, the cost of transport, packaging, freight forwarding. All of those things have a labor component in them. And until you can get into advanced robotics and machine learning to help reduce some of your costs, um, those are those expenses just contributed to increased importation and, and items like that. Well, and there was a point too, specifically about labor costs. Uh, once those costs get built into your overall cost for for whether it's logistics or, or manufacturing itself, once they're baked into that into that the um, the overall cost of the product. It's real hard to get those back out again. I mean, generally, oh, they don't come down. down. They no, they don't come down at all, and that's an unfortunate uh, fact fact of life. Now, you see some some retailers doing rollbacks on on pricing, just but that's more of a marketing ploy, I think, than other, just to get people back in the door. Um, and uh, but but labor rates, you don't suddenly see companies offering, you know, saying, "Well, I can't pay you fifty bucks, and I'm going to pay you fourteen fifty now." That doesn't happen. Right. So you, you, it's baked in and you have to live with it. Yeah, absolutely. So when right. you when, when you first started, when you first started your answer, you, you mentioned something about rocking the boat. And I, I laughed because it reminded me of the, the last time that you and I were together, you, you were presenting at our in-person event for Summit. And um, and an interesting piece to that was at the time there was such a blockade of ships at the ports that had been jockeying for position to try to get their their loads unloaded um i'm assuming by now since it's been almost a year that 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 has kind of unsnarled but it it calls to mind um things about international shipping rates too yes. um yeah. why did international rates change so much well the, the during the covid period all of the ppp um orders that were going to cross the cross to the across the pacific and in china and other countries on the pacific rim were contributing to huge uplift in uh, in shipping not only shipping via sea which you know is a five-week process before you get to port but then also on airlift the airlift rates went went crazy as well during that time but we saw rates going from um, you know, fifteen hundred dollars a container to twenty thousand a container, ridiculous amounts uh, of, of increase. But it was all supply and demand, so it's not so much inflation pushing that. Simply, so supply and demand creates increase in price, which creates inflation. And um, and and when you look at where we uh, remember, we were Port of Los Angeles and. Uh, Port of Long Beach had 88 ships at one time uh, sitting offshore. Uh, I'll come back to that in a little minute around the, 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 how much that cost to a business. Mm -hmm. um, so it, we had huge backlogs in ports, um, and that was essentially this COVID supply orders, which were dri driving that. Um, and so, uh, and I'll give you an example. If you ordered a um, a, a couch set for your your house, your apartment. Mm -hmm. uh, one, they were quoting six month delays to get those through, um, mm -hmm. and it, I think at some time it even went to nine months. I personally had that experience, um, but also the cost to bring in a sofa set. Let's say um, we used to be about six. If you take divide the container price by the yeah. furniture that's inside it. Um, there was about sixty dollars uh, to bring an item in. That went to six hundred, yeah. you know. And the retailers had, couldn't; they couldn't absorb that, obviously. So they had to pass that through. Um, and I think, uh, to your point earlier, that the that inflation has stuck, and it, it's not going now. The rate of inflation has reduced, and there are mm -hmm. lots of reasons for that, that that has happened. Um, but essentially. The backlogs have gone away, but you still and the price. Obviously, the price of containers are now down back in that fifteen hundred to two thousand region. Um, or there's been just recently been a little little uptick there. Um, but um, when we're not, you know, there there are more ships sitting off 
uh, Ningbo and Shanghai ports at the moment, uh, waiting for orders because we have a reduced order um, a book that's going out to China for over over inventory carrying here, and a lot of the retailers um, there there also. Two Christmases ago, remember a lot of the stuff that was supposed to come in for Christmas, when you order that back in July and August, never made it. They were still yeah. offshore on the 15th of January, right? Yeah. So we get through return season in February and March, and suddenly all this product starts coming in. Everyone says, well, we don't need to order it for the next year because yeah. Yeah. The, that's, that stuff is, uh, is we've, we've got stuff from last year we can still put in. You know, a perfect example, I, I use that a lot, is the... Um, um, what I call fake Christmas trees. Um, you know, the, 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 they are um, the, the ones that missed Christmas the year before. Well, they went on the shelf last year and at, at the new price, of course, right? And, uh, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. those replenishment orders are not coming in, didn't come in last year. And I think um, the, there is a, re, re, as inflation increases, people order less to some extent. Um, certainly of the sort of household uh, items. So you've seen, um, a, you know, look, look at Bay Bath and Yon as an example. I'm sure that they were, that their their demise has been because of a lack of orders and then um, a lack of ordering in the store. And then they just, and, and, and but their prices went up and people said, you know, I can't afford to buy those, those items. So that's a consequence of, of the inflation in, in the supply chain. Well, I wasn't I didn't I wasn't a victim of the sofa situation the way that you were for me it was my desk I you know COVID hit and I needed a workspace and uh it was fairly makeshift for a good portion of, the, of 2020 before I got the rest of my desk in but right, yeah I mean right. I, I, it's exactly right and and I, I, if you're going to cover this later I don't want to steal any thunder on it but for the longest time especially in manufacturing and distribution um companies had run lean with the uh, with inventory with the idea of keeping inventory low and really relying on just in time um but when you start having supply chain issues like what we have now that throws everything into a tailspin and then people begin to hoard which yes, you know, yes. we saw with household goods and a variety of other things too yes that's true and and what happened with the supply chain is you know when you do just in time you you create tension in the supply chain well there, it's like a rubber band, you know, if you only stretch it so far before it breaks. And, and essentially that's what happened um, back in 2020, 2020 and 21 is that supply chain just broke. And, um, and there was a gap between what you needed and what, it, what was delivered because of what's happening across the Pacific. And, and it wasn't just the Pacific, it was the same thing from Asia into Europe or Europe into the US and back and forth. Um, those ports uh, on the West Coast were just prime examples of what, what went wrong, but it happened in New York, it happened off uh, um, Port of Houston, um, it happened off the East, some of the other East Coast ports as well. Um, yes, it's, it's um, um, that, that tension in the supply chain. So people have begun to build buffers into the supply chain um, saying we can't afford to be stretched that thin anymore. Um, and so that that actually has an, another effect is that, you know, it, it in, people have people have to manage this product coming in. So you have increased throughput through warehouses, you have storage in warehouses. Remember, we had a container shortage. If you wanted to buy, get a container, there weren't enough containers around. At one time, Hapag Lloyd, as an example, had to buy five, put an order in for 500,000 containers. Well, there's only three companies in the world that produce containers at that volume. Uh, two of them are in China, right? And so it had that knock-on effect as well uh, uh, over there. Well, and that that brings up a point that I was I was going to mention too, um, and that is when you have supply supply chain issues like that. Well, I might, I don't want to, I don't don't want to derail you too much. Um, I, I want to come back to the idea of inflation and the relationship with unemployment mm -hmm. and the impact that relationship had on on the economy itself. Definitely, yes, and. You know, uh, those of you who studied economics know the Phillips curve, and it's that rela relationship on, on unemployment and inflation. And, you know, if you drive inflation down, um, 
to you actually create um well it's the other way around you 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 you're you have an imbalance between inflation and unemployment through the Phillips curve. Well it kind of threw that to the wind um because unemployment happens through, through people being uh laid off companies having to shut down people on lockdown all of those things that we forgot about now basically um but if you think back it was it was only 18 months ago we were coming out of lockdowns right and so businesses were were beginning to hire again we had unemployable people because there were still a large number of cases of covid and and so that also had an effect on increasing prices the hourly rates because you had to pay to get people and attract people um and then um and a number of businesses were saying well people just being at home and they don't want to come to work anymore um and so that and that's i think it's sorting itself out now but that the def definitely um it, it, unemployment and inflation were, were they they work together right yeah well, and interest rates also have that in, an impact on um, inflation. Uh, as a matter of fact, while we've just while we've been in this webinar, I got a notice. <laughs> I got a notice through my phone that um, that the Fed has, I believe, they've increased rates as of today. But Again, they continue. To, yeah, they continue to raise rates to help stem inflation. But take us through how that impacts the the full supply chain and supply chain costs. Right. Um, so um, that's very interesting because, you know, the pundits were out this week saying, well, probably they won't or maybe they will, you know, but were, um, the, the, the majority was sort of saying that maybe they'll just have the status quo. And I just think they've they've done that because they still see inflation as a as a as a risk. And uh, so they said, you know, we're just going to um, push up interest rates. Well, so come to, how, how does that impact the supply chain costs? Well, um, just think of those ships uh, sitting off uh, the port of Los Angeles during during that COVID period, 88 ships, and they were there on average for about five to six weeks um, before they came into port, because the ports usually, so port of Los Angeles has berths for about 10, 10 big container ships, right? Yeah. And these container ships now carrying 24,000 um uh 20 foot container equivalents are uh, on them that's huge these are huge beasts and it takes them three days to unload one of those and once those are in the port you then have to pull them out the port but if you don't have drivers to pull them out out, out of the port you know, all of that has knock on effect every day so for if you have a a, a container sitting uh, there's about 36 billion dollars worth of product sitting on a 24,000 container ship staggering numbers so you work your cost of in your in, in interest rate cost on that for a financing cost in working capital it's about five million dollars per day all right which doesn't get absorbed by the manufacturer that gets passed on you know because once once especially if you have fob and you're you're paying for the product from from x works out um you're paying the interest on that your bank's not paying it they're gonna charge you more and so it that had a major effect on um uh on on the knock-on effect throughout the supply chain uh, for that okay well and i was noticing I'm, I'm monitoring the the chat as well and i did check my my little watch um, the pundits called it correctly, and I, I do stand corrected. The Fed did not raise rates today. They kept them. Oh, they they kept them the same. No, nope, they kept them the same. So the, the pundits called it, but um, I, I appreciate the comment from um, from the attendees too on that. Good. Okay, so well, it stands. It stands true that had they increased it, it would have had that <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so according to the World Health Organization, we are truly and officially post-pandemic now. So considering it a post-pandemic world, what what do you envision for the supply chains? Well, obviously the um, the need for PPP uh, tumbled completely. Yes. So that took a lot of tension out of the uh, shipping side of supply chain. Um, still uh, and so the number of orders that were made to manufacturers for a lot of those things and um companies had retooled some of their uh, manufacturing to deal with covid products you know or any of the ppp um so they're they're now able to go back to doing the main thing which is produce what they used to sell 
to the, into the retailers or other other businesses in the whole ch- manufacturing B to B to B to C chain. Yeah. Um, so um, so those rates rates tumbled uh, on the transatlantic uh, and trans Pacific uh, uh, rates tumbled, and so. But supply and chain, supply and demand has tumbled at the same time, right. um, and so they kind of those work in tandem most most of the time anyway. And as I said earlier, we've got uh, I think the last count of something like 105 ships sitting off Ningbo and Shanghai, empty, uh, waiting to be to, to get orders into them. Which and that uptick will happen again during you know June, July, August. We're in June now, but. Uh, you know, we start thinking about next Christmas um, and Thanksgiving around about now. It, you yeah. know, and if you, your orders aren't placed first of September, you can be dead. And especially if you have some tension in the supply chain, you can be dead in the water um, by the time you 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 get to Christmas and not have product on the shelf. But there are still I've I've talked to businesses and there's still a number of companies that have product sitting um, that that they've got old stock that's there um it's probably not so much in the retail space but a lot of the manufacturing companies have hedged a little bit on on carrying extra extra inventory um so um it it, no i I mean i i think today uh certainly the the supply chain has flattened uh obviously it's uh and, and well we just learned from the fed that they've they've they think that inflation is sufficiently under control now not to have to increase um uh, interest rates well that's 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 good news uh how uh, what is an acceptable because sometime or other they were talking about two percent inflation as as being you know the acceptable rate of inflation in europe they're you know they're not they're way off that still today and i think we're way off somewhat off way off that today um will that continue i i uh, again i don't know but it's a you know the fed works on um uh, inflation unemployment and the the treasury works on money supply right yeah. uh and 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 i think the, the the fed has the biggest impact clearly on on uh, on that and but carrying cost of inventory as everyone knows especially you know, anything anything you have in, in any any debt companies carry or any working capital requirements they have um is is severely impacted as as uh, you know if the fed increases interest rates so that's good news certainly i i was happy that you used the artificial christmas tree example because at least for at least for this holiday season people are set retailers are set with the with the uh, artificial christmas trees because they already have have some in stock from last year well did you did, i don't know if you noticed but the um the ap- apparently the t- real christmas tree business took off last year because people said you know really why don't we <laughs> why don't we buy a, a real right. tree instead instead because the pr- the prices had spiked on on artificial trees so uh hey maybe it's good for the farmers <laughs> Well, and 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 you see it across other industries as well. Um, of course, manufacturing and distribution and logistics is always a critical component. But one of our other areas of focus at the firm is um, is auto dealerships, and and we saw with the um, limited availability of of processing chips, where some vehicles can use as many as three thousand chips. I was horrified to learn that statistic. But three thousand chips per vehicle could be a consideration, and so you start having hiccups in the supply chain on that. That's what we saw with um, the limited availability of new cars driving up the price of used cars. Yes, that was a that was a, a, a huge knock on effect for that, and that's lack of supply driving the um, used car market uh, up upwards, and of course. That um, and th- and then there's another area which is um, you know gas prices uh, which spiked as well during that period. That was more related to and we'll come back to that a little later on when we talk about you know geopolitical issues. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, you know as in a, another contributor to inflation. I mean I see in the supply chain this uh, gas obviously is a big one. Um, and uh, if you have any hits to refining capacity, if you have a- any hit- hits to production in a, um, in a in a country where uh, there's a civil unrest, 
uh, then that has necessarily an impact down, down the road. Um, but you look at packaging, you look at packaging went sky high last year as well. Um, everyone was looking for packaging and there's been a move. And I, I remember at the, at the um, uh, seminar, the conference, I, I spoke at your conference, um, we were talking about the, the cost of, um, of, of things like packaging, uh, anything that goes into that total cost of product uh, was being impacted by um, by 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 inflation. Um, I um, so I, I think that um, as we move forward into 2024, uh, I'm not a prophet, but um, you know it's um, I, I see a, certainly a flattening of inflation, um, but uh, a re complete regression. I'm not so sure. Uh, again, I'm not a, um, a, a TV pundit, so uh, I, I will uh, step back on that one. Well, but I'm going to give you a chance to get out your crystal ball and uh, and give us some of what you think are the predictions um, for the second half of 23 and looking forward into... Um, I. I certainly don't want this to be a political discussion, but the economy and politics are so inextricably intertwined that you, totally, you can't totally. talk about one without at least a reference right. to the other. Right. Um, and there's some big things on the horizon in 24 for us. So uh, right. gazing into no. your crystal ball, what do you what do you see? All seeing? right, Let, my crystal ball is this small, right? It's not that <laughs> right. small, that right. big. Okay. Um, so now assumption number one, there is going to be, there's not going to be another pandemic. That's the number one assumption. Uh, and if it sort of began to grow, it took about a year to kick in of its full effect during COVID. So it wasn't just, a, oh, we have a pandemic and it hit. Um, so if it started now, it wouldn't have a, an effect probably till 25, maybe even into 26. But the number one assumption I have is that there is not. Two um, is, the R, the R word, the that's the recession word, and um, that is, um, it, you know, the, you, and again, you look at the pundits; they all say yes. Smaller, big R, um, you know, big R will hit the economy and therefore will make unemployment go up. Um, or all of all of those things will happen. Um, and uh, but I don't see personally. I don't see a big R. And I talk when I talk to businesses uh, around this area and elsewhere. It seems that they've had a, some downturn in volumes and 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 pro, pro, uh, production, but um, it's not the, it's not the big R, you know. Okay. And so I think we can probably put that one on the back burner uh, as well. The second big letter is E for election. Um, that one is, um, well, it's anyone, I, again, it's anyone's guess. Right. Um, and, um, but again, you know, you have, you look at the way the stock market works, doesn't seem to follow rational thought processes around a, a recession or around, um, you know, election, election uh, punditry, I, I guess is the word, word for it. Um, but it's anyone's guess what will happen after um, the 2024 uh, election, you know, um, a lot can happen between now and then. And, um, you know, um, I, and again, I'm not talking on either side. I'm, I'm from right. Europe. <laughs> so, <laughs> I take no sides, as they say. Okay. Um, but but definitely um, the, the, the election results could could be uh, a big factor there as well. Well, and you mentioned being from Europe. Let's uh, let's broaden our scope a little bit and think more along the lines of geopolitical concerns mm -hmm. worldwide. Well, that's the third big letter, isn't it? It's the G I call the G yeah. word, which is uh, uh, geopolitics. And uh, you know th that ha I ha I personally think that has a bigger in uh, potential for ha to having impact on the R word um potentially than let's say um the elections or or uh, um or, or again another pandemic um god forbid um yeah. so let's look at the three the three key areas 
China, Taiwan, I look at that as a major issue because if there is a conflict there, uh, our supply chain is going to get disrupted uh, and therefore, uh, again, it's it, and it's cost push inflation, right? It, it's the supply chain, lack of supply creates um, increased prices and creates inflation. So that's going to, that that is one of the risks there. Um, the Russia-Ukraine solution, um, I, uh, you know, everyone is worried about the increased involvement of European countries or the NATO countries, uh, and were there to be an invasion of one of the other NATO countries and everyone gets in, involved with Title V and, 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 you know, NATO falls in behind and says we have to do this, that's again a potential risk. Uh, will that happen? I don't know. Um, and. I don't think anyone really knows at this this stage. Perhaps Mr. Putin uh, has an idea, but um, <laughs> it's there. There are so many people moving parts on the uh, ally side that that um, that that's you know you not one single person or country that's dealing dealing with uh, supporting the the issues of of Ukraine. Um, the other area that I do see impactful for um, for price of gas and oil in general is the China Saudi Iran deal. Um, because um and and then you have Mr. Erdogan who just got reelected and how Turkey can be impactful in, in, in that. Um, a lot of people are very worried about the influence that China is having in Saudi, whereas we had a very strong relationship. Um, and, um, and and that seems to be being overlooked to some extent today. Um, and if something happens there, um, that also can spike oil prices. You know, we're currently, I think, $78, $80 a barrel, some, somewhere in that range. It sort of moves around every few days. Um, but, um, you know, where that to spike back up to 100 uh, and yeah. it's not unfeasible, it would right. be very quick, um, then it's going to have impact on um, prices at the pump. And that impacts not only... Um, individuals um, like you and me and, and the people on this um, uh, webinar, it impacts uh, every business and right, transportation right. and your transportation rights, rates are gonna go up. And we still have a shortage of drivers. You know, um, it's uh, when you pull product out of a port, um, a container out of a port, there's a, the, the word for it is dreyage um, and it's, so, and that takes the container from the port to its first stop in its travel across the US. Those companies that do dreyage cannot find enough drivers. So you're having backlogs of, even if you get the ships unloaded, you're having backlogs inside the ports. Uh, and when you see containers stack 10 high, uh, as opposed to five high or four high, it's very difficult to select the one that's at the bottom of the pile if that's yeah. the one you need to get out without trying to move stuff around. And right. that becomes, um, uh, and, and, and so if you don't, and then, then if you don't have the drivers and the trucks to do the drayage, to pull those items out, you have a problem. And then the, tra the tra trucking industry in general is, is short supply of, of drivers, especially on the long haul, um, over the road and long haul. Uh, less so on, you know, local delivery uh, networks like FedEx, UPS, they're local drivers, but any anything in that truck, uh, LTL, TL, is also being impacted by um, lack of drivers as well. And again, as we, as we know, once those prices go up, they don't come down. Now, FedEx and UPS apply, and a lot of transport companies apply a um, fuel surcharge when, and the, okay. that, that, flat, that does fluctuate um, based on, because they use an algorithm that bases it on, on the price at the pump, essentially. Um, but um, if, you know, if, and if that spikes, then that fuel surcharge goes up. But their base rates never come down. You know, they <laughs> they they're very good at that. I, I used to get to know pricing pretty well when I was at FedEx, and right. and uh, you know, I I know that we never reduce rates. Yeah, for, well, that's for sure. It, it's like the labor costs that we talked about earlier too. Once they get once yeah. that that labor cost gets baked baked into mm -hmm. the total cost of production, it. it it's rare, if ever, that it's spun out separately and reduced. Right, absolutely. So the areas where we could reduce cost in the supply chain um, 
are obviously more uh, in manufacturing um, and it would be the use of robotics. And of course, in, you know, in, in tier one um, with automotive and all of that, there's major use of, of robotics uh, in there. But it, and then you look at the ways a lot of warehouses and 3PLs are moving from um, having individuals pick to robotic picking. And, uh, um, and remember the seminar, we talked about the shift from um, containers to pallets mm -hmm. to cases of product to pallets to cases to each is in the e-commerce world so that you on a production on a fulfillment line instead of someone picking a case of 24 to send it to a distributor um or to or to some retailers that would split the, the box then on e-commerce a lot of it's the single item the each as we call it and so that requires more people on the fulfillment lines to be able to deal with that um, mm -hmm. that that volume, uh, and therefore it's driven a lot of companies to put robotics and uh, um, movable devices uh, and automation inside warehouses more than they've they've had before. Yeah, well, and, and that that makes sense. Um, I want to throw one other thing out there. Um, when you and I had talked a little bit ago, um, it was fresh off the heels of what was essentially. Um, a China-led new uh, new G7 summit, essentially, where um, where Russia was invited, um, the U.S. was not. But what are your thoughts on maybe an Asian answer to the G7 summits that we see coming out of Europe? Well, it's going to change the 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 perception of the alliances between the di different international countries, and it. Well, from China's point of view, you know, China has been looking at um, uh, the the way they have a seventy year view on their 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 plan, and they don't veer in, in the last 30, 40 years. They haven't veered off this plan. You know, the master plan stays, and it's um, and they keep executing against against it, and it's very stealth mode. Look at look at Africa. Most of the major ports in Africa have been built by Chinese companies, and they ship in Chinese uh, um, labor to do that. The main reason behind that is because they know a lot of these countries aren't going to be able to pay for it in cash terms, and therefore they demand the rights to minerals. And um, it's, it's in, in my mind, that is one of the big Chinese risks um, of, of, of them doing, and they do this all over. And they haven't, they've done it to a little bit of extent in, in South America, but it's cunning. And so that to me is if they, if they take over as a kind of, well, they're already a superpower. Right. They're no longer a third world nation or a second world nation. They are a first world nation. If they take over, um, as a major policy driver for, for international trade um, and, and it diminishes the impact for the US, um, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty, um, pretty telling. And uh, if, they can, if they can do a, an equivalent of a G7, it, would be, it might be a P7 or something like that for, <laughs> right. um, for Pacific, you know, it's really, again, and then you've got this additional that's new, what they call the new Silk Road that they're they're building to, to that will bring product overland from Asia through to um, uh, through to Europe, um, which is again it's going to be a rail or or road network. Uh, it's that's going to happen, you know, and it's it's a it's a monster uh, undertaking to do, yeah. uh, and it will take a few years for that for that to happen. And there was recently, there was recently a deal directly between one of the South American nations, and I want to say it was Venezuela um, and and China directly, um, that was opening up trade, a new trade route that hadn't been utilized historically. Well, the the you know, it seems to all the, all the bad guys are trying to suddenly get together, and you know, so. You know, wherever I see Erdogan involved, or I see Venezuela, for instance, involved, you know, with the level of poverty that's in that country is just outrageous, and uh, um, and no one quite knows where all the money goes. 
Um, but it's, you know, the banana republics of, of Africa as well. A few years back, you know, no one quite knew where all the money went, but it clearly didn't get back to the people. And uh, so those are, those are uh, really big issues. And if you find, and I don't know who's running Cuba today, still probably very much a Russian influence, but I hear that China's putting a base, um, a military base in, in, in Cuba. That's worrisome as well. From a geopolitical point of view, um, and uh, so these different influences on from the bad players um, is uh, it, 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 it's certainly something that we need to keep a big focus on because the downstream potential impact on supply chain and therefore pricing and inflation is huge. Um, well, we have, we're kind of coming up on our time, but I do have one or two questions that I would like to bring out from sure. the chat, if I could. Yeah. And, and we, we touched on the first one um, already a little bit, but I, I want to go ahead and make sure that we've, we've covered it thoroughly enough. So mm -hmm. the question that came through is, what sort of effect, if any, are the cold political relations between China and U.S. having on the supply chain? I think their immediate effect is fairly limited because businesses are still doing business together. They're still placing orders. I think a lot of American companies, they're on, on, on bringing production back to the US in a number of areas has been a good thing and will certainly continue. Uh, looking for alternate sources of supply. So a lot of the um, uh, furniture manufacturing that went offshore when it with the demise in North Carolina and most of the companies doing doing uh, manufacturing of, of uh, furniture in, in North Carolina. When that went offshore, a lot of it actually went to uh, Vietnam and Indonesia. And um, so th and that and not only went, some went to China, but they've slowly moved that away to other sources of supply across the Pacific Rim. Um, I, um, it, the, the, what you see in the war games that are happening today between China and Taiwan uh, is very worrying. And um, I, I, you know, again, I don't want to get political about this, but it's the, right. it's the, it's the uh, perception of strength on the American side to what's going on over there. And um, is that, you know, well, if you don't ask me not to do it, I'm going to do it. And, <laughs> uh, and, and so um uh, no one quite knows, you know, you, you, you can't be in, in um, uh, Xi Jinping's brain and say, what's he thinking about? Um, is he going to invade Taiwan or not? Um, I, we, I don't think we know yet. No one really can tell. But if that happens, that, that, that would be a disaster, I think. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you to, to put your, your director of operations, your CFO hat back on and think about um, on, a, on a much smaller scale, bringing it down to an each, if you will, um, into an individualized company point of view. So we've talked a lot about, um, we've talked about a lot of topics that are finance related, um, but taking a look inside the house, what, what advice or what comments would you make to CFOs or um, controllers that are responsible for running the organizations from a financial point of view, what maybe recommendations or comments would you make in terms of collaboration um, or if you have processes or production production elements that are siloed, um, what do you see as some of the key issues in-house rather than a, 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 a maybe a more global take on it? No, I, uh, that's a very good point. I mean, the role of the CFO is, is to control cost um, and, uh, and, and help improved net margins, right? Um, and so their uh, inventory is going to be number, is, is a big one because you can play around with inventory and uh, you know your inventory costs can escalate. Uh, uh, um, so remaining lean, obviously yeah. from a manufacturing point is, is important. Um, but as soon as you build some buffers into your supply chain, your inventory levels are going to go up because they're on you know, they may be pulsing across the waters so that you, um, so that's one way of saying, well, let's look at our, our production forecasting over a period of time. And in fact, see how, what impact it has on co cost per unit uh, by pulsing orders over 12 months, as opposed to three, three 
So you get so much a month coming in as opposed right. to every quarter. Um, but usually there's a trade-off in price when you when you ask a, a, a manufacturer um, to, to do that. Um, increased automation, the big, big thing for them to do, um, uh, you know, how, how can you, how can you, uh, imp again, process improvement. That's what a lot of what I do. Uh, I'm a Six Sigma guy. And, okay. and the whole time as you're looking at lean, you're looking at pro processes that you can eliminate that are redundant. Either re It's amazing when you go into a business and see how much redundancy there is in some of the processes. And people are still doing things they were doing before. And no, so I'll give you an example, and you've probably seen this uh, a lot of times, and many of our um, uh, listeners have probably seen that before, is, you know, um, you produce a report and you keep producing that report month in, month out, and it gets sent out to a group of people. And, um, and the day you stop producing that report, you suddenly, oh, no one complained not seeing that report this month. <laughs> You know, it's a, it, it's a it's a funny example, but, you know, that's the sort of thing that if you can if you can cut this and this is all part of lean, isn't it? Really, right. uh, all of this, these things and you, that you just have to keep hammering at that because that's the only way you can offset the inflationary costs on product and uh, your your imported goods. Now, the other there's another area, though, which is, I think, really important. Most businesses have a core competence. And that is to design, manuf manufacture, and ship product. Are they? Uh, and if you're in a retailer, your core, your core competence is marketing and selling your products. Right. It yeah. is not in logistics and supply chain. And there are people who do that really well. Um, and it's not just in the um, uh, it's, it's it's not just the three PLs. Um, you know, even in the military, defense logistics agency is probably the, they support every branch of the military and and um, and supply and maintain that level of supply out to anyone that's in the field. So um, and they they have some of the best logistics brains uh, in, in this country, which is actually quite remarkable. Um, but every com company uh, should look at potential to outsource um, their warehousing and distribution to a 3pl it doesn't always cost so much more money because there's lots of hidden costs soft costs that are behind the management of warehousing and distribution and if you outsource it to a third party and maintain control over the slas and the quality of that service um it actually can be a significant uh, value add you know, I and I, I used to sell that to companies uh, when I was at FedEx the whole time because that was our business was to do do that work. <laughs> right. But I think I think, but I've been inside businesses since, and um, I, I've um, and I, I've proved the point and a number of times. Well, and if you boil it down, I mean, essentially, that really is just making the most of um, your competitive advantage, capitalizing on, you know, what you what you can do well. And cost effectively take in house, otherwise outsource the rest. And and companies outsource marketing as well. They keep you know, marketing agencies develop a you know <laughs> not everyone. You keep a core team in in house, but a lot of times companies will outsource that to the the, the marketing agencies that have that strength in numbers to be able to become real experts or say digital marketing for instance is, yeah. is a new area um and the the management of social media for companies all of those drive um can drive cost savings uh, and therefore you know ultimately uh, that can it won't reduce um it won't reduce your costs uh on a unit you know, it won't have, it'll have an impact on stopping inflation increasing anymore. As you said earlier, the cost is baked or any of anything that happened before today is baked in, right? Yeah. And it's not going to necessarily come up. But if you can reduce your cost per unit by outsourcing critical elements of it or eliminating critical elements, that actually helps you down, down, down street. Yeah. Well, perfect. 
Well, Anthony, I really appreciate it. We are we have come up on our, our time at, um, for 50 minutes. There are one or two other questions that we didn't get to, but I will go ahead and send those to you. Maybe um, they can address them on a one-off capacity. Absolutely, yes. Look forward to that. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. All right. Um, well, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Oh, this thank you for having me. It's been fun. I enjoyed it, it immensely. We did as well. It's, it's good to see you again. We're glad you're back here working with us on, um, on our presentations. Um, again, thank you for joining us in the audience today. This was a really, I feel like this was a really great conversation. Um, the one or two questions that we do still have in the chat, I'll make sure that, um, that Anthony gets those. And um, of course, if there's anything you need from us, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you for joining us. We'll catch you at the next one on June 28th for chat GPT. And the one after that on July 14th or 12th um, for AI and data analytics. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone.